Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of European Blockchain Convention 2021. We're so excited to be here with you today. We have an amazing keynote from Lone. She was speaking earlier this week already in a panel, and she's now going to present what's going uh, on at, the, at her project, Concordium. Lone, welcome on stage. Glad to have you on board. Thank you so much. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Concordium, which is one of the newest uh, blockchain um, with our CCD uh, cryptocurrency. And um, we came on the main mainnet this summer and have a lot of activity already at our chain. We have just launched um, the decentralized uh, fintech lab, regulated decentralized fintech lab initiative as a part of our community endowment program. And we have allocated 100 million euro worth of um, tokens in order to um, intensify and test and try new decentralized fintech products, which um, then will be regulatory uh, compliant. So we are super excited to invite people on board this initiative. When our founder, uh, Lars Sayer, uh, who is also the founder of uh, Saxo Bank, uh, actually project number 100 on the internet back in the 90s, um, he had a lunch at this point in time, Christmas lunch with Charles from Cardano in 2017 and heard about Cardano. But when he listened to it and with his background and our background, most of us in Concordium do come with a heavy financial background. We understood this was not sufficient just to put a blockchain up, which had a lot of um, issues um, um, in order for financial institution or even large corporations um, to use a blockchain. What um, we think are the issues is, first of all, that you don't have identity, that you can um, work anonymous on, on the uh, blockchain. As much as uh, 4 to 5 percent of the world GDP is, is, is actually, say, um, if you put a price tag on what lack of trust between people actually could um, build of growth in the world. Um, number one for us was to create trust. You have to know who you are transacting with. And therefore, we have identity at um, the protocol level. So anybody using our blockchain will have their identity uh, validated. And you have then you, I, your identity will be, uh, say, printed in an encrypted way on all transactions. That also gives uh, regulators a possibility um, if they have a court order, if, if they have legitimate um, access to, to, to have the information, what has been transacted at what point in time, exactly as when you are transacting in a bank. It might sound very boring, and, and um, when we first launched this idea some years back, um, we, we had a lot of, say, opposition. Now I think everybody understands uh, regulation is coming into um, the blockchain and crypto space exactly as it is um, in the world outside. It's totally parallel, and this is why we did it. We did see that coming. Um, so with the new legislation in, in, in Europe, if I just speak from, from Europe, um, there are the new AML demands and the new MICA demands coming in, and you cannot do anonymous um, payment transactions for the future. Our blockchain is very well suited um, to build any of your regulated decentralized fintech um, um, cases on Concordium. So um, that will ease the compliance. Also, the next thing um, we saw is if you don't have finalization, immediate finalization, I'm being a little bit technical to say you can't live with probabilistic finalization where you will have um, rollback and have a likelihood of rollback. Um, but if you have deterministic finalization as we do in our protocol, then you know immediately in split seconds that you are transaction is is final this is what you need if you are building um most use cases um this is why we use blockchain we want it to be immutable and we want to know that we have transacted and and that's final 
Um, the other thing um, we found when we were an, an, an making an analysis of, of blockchain was that um, in the financial world, uh, anything is going towards zero in transaction costs. So for us, it was not likely that you could have large scale adoption of blockchain if you don't have a uh, stable and very low transaction cost. And this is why the transaction cost on um, Concordium is uh, going towards zero. It is stable in euro terms and then denominated in our um, payment token, the CCD. Um, then it is um, possible to to uh, to budget what you are doing and and have a, um, um, a transparent knowledge of what your use case will will cost. I, I think this is alpha and, and omega to um, to have. So these are some of the features we were building in. But also when I look at the heavy software demand, and I'm also the vice chairman of Volvo Cars, I sit at the board of IKEA and I sit at the board of uh, other Norwegian uh, companies who are building um, platforms in, in the North Sea, building also um, under other uh, regulations. Um, you need to make sure that the software you're using is, is stable, that it's doing what it should do. And um, our protocols are built from uh, science protocols made by COPA, um, Concordium Blockchain Research Center at Aarhus University and at ETH. In, um, in Switzerland and the protocols, we have our own science team who are then um, doing from the peer-reviewed protocols. Um, so peer-reviewed um, in the best conferences um, for, for the various areas, be it uh, cryptographic or in terms of governance, etc., to economics. And then we uh, write the blue paper and we code from that. And then we have a third party um, outside in review of it. So what we say in our white paper and what we code and how it's working is totally consistent. Um, remember that most of the blockchain, even blockchain you see today started as a very interesting, super interesting hobby project, but they were never meant for industrial grade or enterprise grade or financial institution grade, if you like. And um, this is our ambition. We have made this um, mature blockchain, which then is uh, suited for um, large scale adoption. So the latest initiative, and I'll move a little bit so you can see it here behind me, but that is our Concordium uh, decentralized um, fintech lab. And um, we, we are really interesting in, in, in seeing all kinds of use cases coming into that. It is in Zurich. We can um, assist in um, finding the best um, legal advices and, and um, the auditing advice and how it's going to build into um, the software uh, suite. And um, we are looking and have capabilities also in our Copa Center at Aarhus University to look at formal verification of, of smart contract, for example. So we are very excited to um, to get going and see the first um, Texas also built on Concordium um, tokenization projects where uh, you can use the elements of the ID, for example. One a very interesting um, thing that you could lift from our ID object, the information you would like to um, to to have up with zero knowledge proof and and use it in in various ways and also build it in probably to your aml or if you um, have to do um and and perform as as a vesp etc so this is in in short um what we are bringing to the table and um it, we also want to have fun. So I also want to mention we have just uh, launched um, a um, NFT platform on Concordium where also um, it, NFTs are getting um, um, both very expensive, um, but also getting um, um, something you, you want to make sure that you have the original 
um, you want to have the provenance, you want to prove that this is yours and, and the, there our ID also comes very handy in that you can actually um, build uh, that whole provenance site and um, make sure that you can prove um, who was the owner, who is the owner and what is your identity of, of that NFT. So um, with this, I, I will open for questions um, to our blockchain or from the audience if you want to um, discuss some of, of the elements. I don't know, Daniel, if you want to um, right. to open the table. Hello, Hello Lone. Yeah, Hi. Happy, happy to direct you some of the questions from the audience. One question is if um, so people want to know what sort of projects have already applied to the lab, if any, have applied, and what type of projects are you expecting to receive? Is it more... DeFi projects or NFT projects, and if it's DeFi or NFT, what kind of projects or what kind of solutions? Is it more retail focused or enterprise focused? So if you can talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, so um, the first um, projects are, are Dex, Dexes, which which I think is, is very fitted for our um, uh, DeFi um, lab. Um, so with their liquidity pools and um, in that connection, we're also now discussing to build um, stable coin because that's another area. You have the USDT and USDC, but um, we might also um, consider to, uh, to host um, a stable coin project to, um, to support. Another thing we're looking at in, in the lab is um, uh, for, for um, uh, structured products to tokenize uh, structured products, which is also super interesting. Um, what it could be, it's, if it can be any structured product, and and then you can put some, say, um, various um, probably um, either um, hedge against um, interest or FX elements into these products. So this is what what people right now are very interested in in building. Got it. Another question from one attendee is, do you think DeFi is catching less attention because of the metaverse? Um, I think it's two uh, completely different things. Um, I think there's, uh, we had the NFT and metaverse, yes, but I, I see a lot of um, financial institution being very interested in um, the DeFi. And I think it's, uh, I was um, comparing this when I spoke on Monday. Um, uh, now we are speaking here at Zoom. Um, if it was years back, we would be speaking probably on the phone, but it's still um, the same providers of the infrastructure before we paid for a call and now we pay for the, for, for the infrastructure. We don't pay for this call. And I think this is also what is, going uh, to happen on the DeFi. So it would be different um, financial institutions moving in now and understanding how they can use these products and uh, leaning in with their capacity. And that is, again, to take care of people's money. We trust um, at least the banks. Maybe maybe we'll, we will lose on the products, but um, we trust that the money we put in the banks are there and they don't just disappear. I think that is one of the elements where the established institutions, even on a decentralized um, a pass, do have um, also um, something to bring to the market. And the ongoing discussion is who is it, is it most easy for a bank who have the total compliance in place, which you now need to have also as as a um, digitalized um, provider or obliged person, as you would call it in the AM AML terms, is it easier for a bank to apply blockchain and, and decentralization, or is it easier for a, a, a newcomer to provide the whole AML and, and Mika 
um, uh, regime. And it, it sounds tempting that you are lean when you come with a total uh, fresh mindset, but um, I have tried both. I've both been in a very established environment in Credit Suisse and Handelsbanken. I have also made um, fintech and now we're doing blockchain and we do the regulated decentralized finance. And I tend to think it might be easier um, if, if you really are there for the established also to come in now where you need to apply regulation. So I think there'll be a battle for, for a couple of years. Um, I think also um, the established financial institutions will learn a lot from what is going on in the market, in, in particular in terms of usability, um, that it's it's very intuitive and, and, and easy and interesting elements, but then there will be a, a lot of um, discussions on what can you actually do and how do you prote protect the consumer. That's at the end of the day what the regulator is after. And um, the, the high margins you can earn now naturally comes with a victim. Whenever you can do like 20x overnight or 50x, there's a loser in the other end. And, and that won't last. We saw that coming into the FX market, which was like maybe as the uh, DeFi market is today. The FX market was in uh, the 90s and, and beginning of, of 2000 up to maybe 2010. Um, but today uh, it is not like this anymore. So I think it's it's a moment where, where things are, are boiling forth and back. Very interesting. Yeah, understood. Another question is uh, not it's more focused on Concordium in itself. The question is, how does that work exactly with the ID link to, to the protocol layer, but still maintaining its privacy? How is that possible? Yeah. How does it work? Yeah. So I'll just give a couple of headlines and uh, please read our Medium post. We have a very good explanation of it also in our white paper. Um, lean out if you want to know more, but um, you are identified and we we have a couple of identify, uh, identification providers. You download our app and then you identify yourself with your passport or any um, of the um, ID cards we accept. That is very easy to see in the app and then you get your identity object and from that you can open your um, account, your first account, initial account. And then for security reasons, you can open subsequent accounts. And then when you use it, it's all encrypted. So your identity is off chain. Uh, so we fulfill the GPDR um, um, rules as well. So your identity is not visible on chain. It's only an encrypted version of it. And um, then all transactions would come with that idea. And in your wallet, you can call on, on certain elements of it and use zero knowledge proof. So, for example, if you want to, to prove um, a certain age or a certain nationality, etc. So that is in essence what it is. But it's very important to, to, um, to rest assured that your privacy is, is protected. And this is why we say it's um, privacy with accountability. So no um, anonymous transactions, but privacy, but with accountability. And when we say accountability is that, um, that um, you allow, um, uh, if regulators need to see what has been going on, that can be re relieved with an identity uh, revoker, but only uh, with a court order. So it works exactly as if the regulator is coming into a bank and want to see what transactions have been performed on a certain account. Okay. I think Benny also helped us out here. He just shared the link to the Medium you just mentioned. So people can find the, the article on Medium in the chat. Another question we have here, how is it different from existing DLT solutions such as Cosmos, Polkadot, Tezos? Okay, so they are all very different, um, but um, what we have is that we have um, finalization, immediate finalization. So the co it's a two layer consensus with consensus and then finalization. And the only I can think of uh, right now is Algorand to have finalization at the protocol level. 
um, but they don't have the ID. So that's very different from the existing blockchain. It's also ours is proof of stake naturally, and we also make um, a, a, a big um, um, a survey around constantly where to run our own nodes. So we are hunting a green uh, energy in order to make it as, as green as possible. And we actually just moved a couple of our um, notes in order to um, to be sure that that we constantly have um, a green blockchain. And that's another thing. Um, now I'm taking my um, Fortune 500 hat on again. But from this year in Europe, you're going to sign the ESG accounting if you are um, a bigger company or a listed company. And um, in all companies now, you, you have to have an ESG regime in place. What I see the trend is in most companies are that these becomes exactly as you have your controls for your financial um, numbers, you would have controls for your ESG. So all decisions, everything you do have then to be um, into the ESG reporting. Um, many are getting ESG rating, but there will be also a couple of years now where you will see basically everything you think about um, you do in a company have to go in. It's not only about um, CO2, but it's about um, the whole uh, way you are conducting and, and you take your strategic decisions. And this is why absolutely it would make no sense. For example, take Volvo um, and, and uh, the Geely Group is also one of our investors. We are using the blockchain now to build and support autonomous drive building on on blockchain for certain of the par parameters will very soon come out with some explanation of uh, this is a super interesting use case. But take that um, when we have EV cars in Polestar and, and Volvo, if we were running blockchain of proof of work, using so much electricity to prove um, certain things around, for example, uh, where you do the, the, the harvesting or if you do urban mining for cobalt for your batteries, it would make absolutely no sense to run it on proof of work and then spend so much electricity. Remember, Bitcoin is right now using so, something like 0.5% of the world's electricity. And then you would use that to prove that you are sustainable. It, it's just a contradiction in, in terms. So these these are the things we, we also want to make a, a people aware of, because there's a lot of, say, um, still a lot of education for us all um, to, to still have before the whole thing is, is mature. So we hope we can have these dialogues also with um, the industry. Blockchain for driverless, driverless cars. So this is getting even more fun. Yeah. We have another question from Sagar. He is asking, what's the role of decentralized Oracle networks in DeFi? He wants to know your opinion on decentralized Oracle networks. Yeah, so it depends uh, how you want to uh, to use it. I think one thing on decentralized, um, and when you do um, the whole element of decentralization, we were listening to um, the panel on Monday, um, and there are opinions about, say, trust that if you decentralized everything, you 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 you're not suffering, say, from lack of trust between people. I think that. That whole area still needs a lot of research because at the end of the day, it is a technology, it is coding. So that's the elements. So you cannot just put it um, to work without again, uh, being behind and, and making sure that things are, are working. So I think on the whole element of decentralization, which is also important in order to create a decentralized DEX and, and don't have the um, uh, don't become a VASP, for example, but still, um, what kind of money, how can you test it? How can you verify um, two things that your things are working and that they are working as um, intended so that the contract is actually code, coded the way it, it should work, but also that um, the whole thing is is uh, sufficient, solid, there are no backdoors, et, et cetera. So I think that whole element still needs really to be um, developed. 
Understood. Uh, we have less than 30 seconds left. Lone, I wanted to ask the last message from the Concordium DeFi Lab. What's the message you want to leave for the audience? Yeah, please join us. Go to our website and uh, join us on, on the um, DeFi uh, lab. Um, we want to, to work and understand how we can apply regulation and still stay decentralized because there's so much um, cool to build and, and support. So please join us. Thank you very much, Lone. For the audience to know, Lone and her team have also a virtual booth in our exhibition area and they will be happy also to attend more questions. Thank you, Lone, once again. Thank you so much. And see you in the next session. We will. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.